version 3 of my Direct Extruder prototype is now working quite well. Even large print jobs are processed without any problems. Here I print the main gear of the extruder, as the original part has to be replaced due to wear. The excessive stress during the long experimentation phase resulted in the shaft of the gear being worn out so that the screw no longer rotated. Only with a special trick I could use the gear for a final print job. An M6 nut on the screw head ensures that the M8 nut no longer reaches into the worn area of the shaft. The road to a well functioning extruder was not a straight one. I had to deal with a lot of unsuccessful attempts, here are just a few of them. Success is sometimes nothing but good luck. Failures always have a reason and only those who are willing to find the crux of the matter will achieve their goal. Systematically trying out different screw designs, varying the diameter and length of the extruder and experimenting with different grain sizes have gradually led to better results. In most of the attempts, sooner or later the extruder got clogged. The longer and thinner the bore in the extruder, the higher the friction of the granulate on the walls, which I will demonstrate with a quick experiment. The three tubes are all filled with compacted granules. Nevertheless, it is easy to push the granulate through the short and wide metal tube with the screw. The same can no longer be achieved with the longer and thinner tube, even with great effort. In the case of the teflon tube with the same dimensions on the other hand, it is possible to push the granulate through again, also a little effort is required. The plastic is heated in the extruder, which leads to further problems. Cold granules fall from a metal surface when tilted. As the temperature rises, however, the plastic becomes quite sticky, adhering well on the metal surface. At even higher temperatures, the plastic melts completely and can now be easily conveyed through the extruder. The glass temperature of PLA, which is the point at which the plastic begins to soften, is only 50 to 80 degrees Celsius, but it is processed in the extruder at 180 to 210 degrees Celsius. The key zone is where the plastic goes from solid to molten state. This should be kept as short as possible, which is why I use the 8mm glass block as a heat barrier. The fact that the teflon tube extends further into the extruder is essentially due to the fact that the construction also has to be leak proof. Liquid plastic is damped liquid. Speaking of teflon tubes, this is also a plastic that becomes soft and malleable with increasing temperature. In some of my first attempts I had left a small air gap between the hot end and cold end as thermal insulation, only bridged by the teflon tube. Here however, the teflon has deformed over time and thus led to clogging. Where the transition from solid to liquid takes place and how long this area is determines between success or failure of an extruder design. If problems arise, the printer can be switched off and the plastic inside the extruder can be analyzed. The split construction with the glass block as a separation allows for a good look on the processes inside the extruder. In the well functioning extruder, the transition area can be clearly identified and, as desired, is located within the glass block. Above, the sample breaks down into grains, below everything is a compact negative of the teflon tube in the hot end. If the disassembled hot end is heated to around 90 degrees Celsius, the lower part can be pulled out and analyzed more precisely if necessary. These material samples from the inside helped enormously in gradually finding the right dimensions for a well-functioning extruder. 
For example, here you can see that the tip of the extruder screw is clearly not going right through the center of the nozzle. A closer look at the Teflon tube shows that it has widened a bit towards the bottom. I have drilled the hole in the cold end with a 10mm drill, but the Teflon tube has an outer diameter of only about 9.5mm. The heated Teflon has expanded somewhat in the lower area. The now slightly conical shape makes it easier to convey the granulate downwards, whether a 9.5mm hole is disadvantages will be seen in future experiments. Not working 100% according to the specifications is also an advantage for another part. The hole in the glass block is by no means exactly round. The advantage is that the Teflon tube cannot rotate in this hole, an effect that caused problems in earlier versions of my extruder. Manual work can add a little bit of luck to a project that leads to success, but you still have to recognize this luck in order to be able to take over its influence in future versions. For the first, real replacement part that I print here, the speed is set to 30mm per second. The previous video showed that both the extruder and the printer deliver good results at this speed. I actually wanted to test different nozzle diameters in this video, but prototypes always have a life of their own. So for now I stayed with the 1mm nozzle for the spare part I needed. The layer height of 0.7mm and the extrusion width of 0.7mm are also standard. Printing is done with PLA obtained from shredded failed prints. The temperature of the hot end is set to 181 degrees Celsius, that of the print bed to 60 degrees Celsius. The main gear has a diameter of 90mm and is therefore the largest component that I have printed so far. The mechanics of the cheap printer in combination with the handmade extruder leads to a very high background noise from time to time. Backlash in the mechanics leads to audible vibrations, the clear sign of unnecessary wear. The infill is set to 25% with a honeycomb pattern. I had to refill the rather small hopper with raw material about every 20 minutes. An automatic feeder will be implemented in coming versions. According to the calculations of my slicer, the gear wheel consumes about 50 cubic centimeters of PLA, of course in a compact form, not as loose granules. When having a close look at the shaft of the gear, you can see that it tilts a bit to the right. During the long test phase I got used to aligning the print bed very roughly before starting a job and doing the fine tuning while the first layer is printed, doing this not only by turning the adjusting screws of the build plate, but also by turning the spindles of the set axis. The fact that this method is for sure no good idea to get a squared printer mechanics results in the error seen here. Too late to think about it now, so eyes closed and go on. The print job was finished after exactly 4 hours, the extruder worked without any problems. The result was not perfect, but gave me hope that the spare part will be usable. So put it in place and have a test run. The inclined shaft causes the gear wheel to wobble slightly, but plastic comes out of the nozzle, the extruder is up and working again. Another test should show how well it works. As originally planned for this video, I have now installed a smaller nozzle, the diameter is 0.6mm. A very small chain link with the dimensions 27 times 25 times 12 mm is printed. The layer height is still 0.2 mm, but the extrusion width is reduced to 0.5 mm. Printing is done at 20 mm per second. 
The still missing object cooling is particularly noticeable with small structures as can be seen here. Stringing can be clearly seen, I will talk about that in more detail in one of the following videos. In general, the parameters in the slicing software are far from being optimized, it's just a quick print test to show that the extruder can also create small objects. The walls, which are only 2mm thin, are printed quite smoothly, an indication of uniform extrusion. Shading results from the fact that I mixed white and green granulate, so plastic is extruded sometimes darker, sometimes lighter green. With the printed spare part, the extruder obviously does not work any worse than before. So let's put the worn out gear into the blender, more raw material will soon be needed for further experimentation. You can find high resolution images of this and other test prints that are made with the extruder on my Hackaday page as well as on my homepage, have a click. If you want to support me financially in the further development of the extruder, you are welcome to click the donate button on my website, many thanks to everyone who has already sent me an obo. Thanks for watching and I'll be back.